Well, good morning and welcome to our annual issue symposium 2018, The Future at Work. Today we're going to take a look at what the future holds from the lens of the work, the worker, and the workplace of tomorrow. And then we'll ask the question, how would these things shape the workers' compensation system that we're all a part of? But before going forward, please allow me to go back in time a little bit with our 30th anniversary. So from that first meeting in New York City at the Waldorf Astoria, this event has evolved into an industry gathering that we humbly feel is the best of its kind. So last year, somebody used the term to describe this meeting. They called it the Woodstock of workers' compensation. <laughs> now, I must tell you that we decided to take that as a compliment, but it could have gone either way. <laughs> Uh, the folks back then in 1988 were all pioneers at that first meeting, and they were connecting in, in a couple different ways. One was the agenda. The agenda at that time was, had a familiar feel to it. Uh, there was a state of the line address, there was an emerging issues panel, and the title of that meeting was Discussions for the Next Decade. You know, back then, we all shared a passion to serve the worker and the employer in a system that's based upon safety and return to work. And that hasn't changed in 30 years. One thing that has changed notably is the health of the system. Now, this is a slide showing 30 years of results. And I like pre-tax operating gain or loss because it combines the impact of both investment income and underwriting results. And the takeaway here is that there's two different worlds. You see, back in the late 80s and the early 90s, the industry had six consecutive years of operating losses. And when we compare that to now, we've had six consecutive years of operating gains, with five of the last six being well above the long-term average. Now, before we get too comfortable with this result, we should all recognize that this is a very cyclical industry. And if you look for the years, the most recent years, 2009 to 2011, there are three consecutive years of zero operating gain. Kathy Antonello will be up next, and she'll give her state of line report, which does a great job of outlining workers' compensation and the key drivers and what's going on there. But the early, early view is that in 2018, the industry results are healthy. Here's another metric, residual markets, that we look at because it kind of flows with the health of the system. And again, two different worlds. Back in the late 80s and the early 90s, about a quarter of all the premium flowed through the residual market. And the results were not good at that time. During those years, the operating losses reached a billion dollars a year that were passed on to the industry. And a different story today. Today, the residual market is stable and manageable, and that's a good thing. This next metric is not financial at all, but in many ways, it's the most important slide of the three that I put up here. You see, you've saved lives. This is a chart that's showing the ratio of fatalities in the workplace since the early 90s per 100,000 workers. They've dropped 30% despite the recent uptick. And I would argue that this shows the effectiveness of our core mission, which is to create a safe workplace environment. So the industry's healthy, and we're in a good place. But the world around us has changed quite a bit in 30 years as well. And I tried to remember sometimes, you know, how did I connect 30 years ago? You know, the internet wasn't a thing. Email was limited to a few tech communities, and we paid our bills using snail mail. So today, we have this, right? And this thing can do just about anything. So in this age of connectedness, what's interesting is that it was created in part by a company that was decidedly disconnected 30 years ago, Apple. You see, at that time, believe it or not, Apple was one of the worst managed companies. They had an ill-conceived product line, their culture was a mess, their leadership was fighting publicly, and competition was actually eating their lunch at that time. By 1996, their downfall became a cover story. Now they turned it around, and a lot of the credit goes to Steve Jobs, certainly. 
But another key element was that Apple had a clear vision of what the future would look like. And they redefined themselves. By the late 90s, they had a new operating system and new products. In 2001, they launched the iPod. In 2003, they opened the iTunes Music Store, which revolutionized how we bought music. And it changed an entire industry. And then June of 2007, the iPhone hit the market. You see, Apple connected in a whole new way. They connected through technology. They connected through the evolving demographics that were happening. They connected with the future. So the question that we ask is, what can the workers' compensation industry learn, and how can we apply these learnings from this story? You know, Apple was able to connect to their future customers by understanding how the world was changing, and we must do the same connecting in our industry. And that's our word for 2018. It's connecting. Connecting. Why? Because we need to connect with the work of the future as automation changes the job landscape, and we need to connect with the worker of the future because of this demographic shift that's coming our way, and it's real. And we need to connect with the workplace of the future, which is going to be more virtual and leverage technology to a greater extent. So that's where I want to focus today, is exploring the work, the worker, and the workplace of the future. And so that we can better understand how these dynamics will shape our industry and how we can better connect with that future. So newsflash, there will be more robots, there will be more artificial intelligence, and in some job classes, there will be fewer jobs. And if you're a pessimist and you take a pessimistic view, this can be a very scary vision. But I would argue that the future is not a scary place. And just like our eyes adjusting to a very bright light, we're gonna find our way. Let me tell you why I believe that. First, technology transforms, but it takes time. Back in the 1800s with agriculture, it took generations. And with manufacturing, it took decades. Now things are moving faster now, and it's not difficult to imagine a whole new world in the next 10 to 20 years. You know, the smartphone has been out for 11 years. Sometimes it feels longer than that, and it's disrupted many industries and many processes and ways that we do business. But we've adapted alongside it. And I would argue that we are more conditioned and we're better equipped than ever to handle these changes. Last year, NCCI economists analyzed the concept of adoption of automation and how it would impact the workplace. And this is a big deal. There's been some headlines in the last year that have indicated that up to 60 million jobs will be significantly changed, some eliminated within the next 10 years. The key takeaways from this study were that there are natural speed bumps to the adoption of automation. And that's important because if things go faster than slower, that has a different output in terms of automation. And essentially, they came down with three things. One is cost-benefit analysis, which is simply that a business owner will not invest in new technology unless there's significant benefits to the business, or they'll delay it. Number two, it's regulatory issues. There are significant regulatory complexities in adopting new technology, and that tends to slow the process. Third, it's the human element. We have to be prepared for change, and a lot of folks don't want to change. And I want to explore this through two large job classifications, cashiers and truckers. So self-checkout technology has been around for 20 years. There's been, it's been around for 20 years, but the tech has been here, but the job landscape has been slow to change. Now, Amazon opened the Amazon Go fresh food concept up in Seattle last year. It seems to be going well. They're starting to expand it into the state of California. But consider this. 10 years ago, there are 3.5 million cashiers in the US. As of the end of last year, there are 3.5 million cashiers in the US. Let me give you another example, because I want to move on to autonomous cars and trucks. In some ways, they're where self-checkout was 20 years ago. They're real, they're getting attention, and they're making inroads. But they have the same speed bumps. 
Cost. Think about a business owner that has to replace a fleet of trucks with brand new autonomous vehicles. They're going to look at the cost and compare that to the benefits of doing that. On the regulatory side, both state and federal, there are issues like safety and there are economic issues and there are political issues that will impact the adoption of this technology and we're seeing it every day as we play out. And then lastly, it's the human element. The fact is, is a lot of people are not willing to share the road with autonomous vehicles, let alone 18 wheelers. So I just talked about job change and job elimination, and there's another key element to this technology evolution. And it takes a little more imagination to envision this, but it's the creation of new industries. So this is a story about how farming jobs morphed into new ski instructor jobs in the state of Colorado. First of all, 200 years ago, most of the jobs in the United States were about farming. And the reason was simple, people needed to eat. But what happened over time with technology is that food output increased and some of the jobs went away from farming. They went into manufacturing. And manufacturing grew because they manufactured items of necessity, but then they expanded even further because they manufactured things that provided more functionality, like cars and textiles and electronics. And then those jobs morphed into the service industry, and the service industry grew in greater spades because they focused on folks that had more discretionary income, and they were able to use services that were spent for luxury and entertainment items. So my point is that the more advanced that we get, the more innovation becomes about improving the quality of life. So let me go back to the ski story real quick. In 1918, guess how many established ski areas there were in the United States? There was one. People had limited mobility, limited discretionary income, but what has transpired over the last 100 years is that we have better technology, including the automobile that rolled off the lines about 100 years ago, and the ski industry of today one example is they're generating $5 billion in economic impact in the state of Colorado alone. So who could have predicted that there'll be new ski instructor jobs when the first automobiles rolled off the line 100 years ago? This is just one example, and there are many, many more, and it's actually a positive output of some of the automation. But the fact is, is we don't know exactly what change is going to happen, only that change is going to occur. McKinsey's got a study that says that up to 15% of the existing jobs today will be changed significantly by the year 2030. But I would argue that it's an exciting time in workers' compensation. We can imagine new industries and new class codes, new risk profiles, and way to mitigate new types of injury. We have the opportunity to remain relevant if we stay connected as the work evolves which leads me to my next element, which is the worker of the future. So this is the part of the presentation where I get to talk about millennials and Generation Z. And some view this as an entitled group, and like this picture shows, with their eyes on their smartphones. Most were not even born back when the first annual issue symposium occurred in 1988. So I'd like to share a quote that sums some people's view of this up-and-coming generation. I see no hope for the future of our people if they're dependent on the frivolous youth of today. When I was young, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but the present youth are exceedingly disrespectful and impatient of restraint. Does that sound familiar? So we probably have all heard this sentiment well, it might surprise you that this quote came from Hesiod, who was a Greek poet from 8th century BC, nearly 3,000 years ago. You see, generation bashing has gone on for thousands of years. <laughs> and it's easy to find quotes like this throughout time. But I would ask the question, is this critique fair? Because millennials are the most educated generation ever, they're the most diverse in the US and more than 80 million strong. They've grown up with technology, they've adapted with it, and they're highly connected to the world around them. And they might be just well suited to take us into the future. In the next 10 years, boomers are gonna be less than 10% of the workforce. 
Generation X will be down to 35%, and millennials and Generation Z are gonna be more than 50% of the workforce. And not only just the workforce, but they're gonna be the business owners of tomorrow who are buying a workers' compensation product. And my guess is they're gonna have new perspectives on how to connect in even more dynamic ways with all of us. And they're gonna to wanna to know how workers' compensation meets their modern needs. So before we ride into the sunset, I would suggest that we pass on our wisdom and hand them the keys because they're the pioneers of the future and we need to stay connected with them. So my final point in terms of the future of work, workers, is the workplace. You know, we have historical examples to show how work has adapted over the years and demographic data that shows how the workforce has changed over the years. Workplace is more of an educated guess but we can make some strong guesses based upon some recent trends. Number one, the workplace of the future will be safer, and a lot of that has to do with the people in this room creating a safer work environment for the industry. And whether it's robotics or it's wearables, technology will continue to improve safety. The next issue is virtual. Some industries are already seen this. Think telemedicine, online conferencing, and virtual reality. This concept of in the workplace might not be physical at all. There's been a significant growth in companies that are called virtual companies that have no headquarters and no shared office space. Forbes published a data, some data that indicate in the last 10 years, telecommuting is up over 100%. And there are some studies that indicate that in the next few years, more than 50% of the US will be working remotely in some way. The last point is that the workplace of the future will be more connected. And we can conjure up images of the Internet of Things relative to smart refrigerators and connected homes. But that same sensor technology will impact the workplace in ways we can't even imagine. We'll be able to monitor conditions, track workers, amass data for analytics, and we'll have more tools as an industry to understand and mitigate risk. So connecting the work, the worker, and the workplace of the future, the work will transform along the adoption curve of technology. Workers are going to leverage technology and adapt alongside of it. And workplaces will be safer, more virtual, and highly connected. So with all this change coming, what does it mean for us? How do we know that workers' compensation is still working in 10 years, and how do we measure success? Well, I would argue that a key question is, did we move task fast enough to keep up with technology, or did a better mousetrap come along? Are we still talking about modernization, addressing inefficiencies and inconsistencies, or do we get it done? And lastly, on the success side, I would say, did we embrace technology to deliver value, impact, workplace safety, and return to work. And speaking of return to work, what does a return to work success story look like in the future? See, 30 years ago, it was probably a catastrophic injury where the worker came back in a wheelchair in modified duty status. Today, that same worker would come back in full duty status, but in a wheelchair, and tomorrow, Perhaps it's about that same worker wearing an exoskeleton and working right alongside their coworkers. Or perhaps a return to work focus is more on psychological injuries than physical. The fact is, is that success is going to look different, but it's going to reflect our relevance to the work, the worker, and the workplace of tomorrow. And that's why connecting is so important, and it ties back to the word from last year, adapting, which is just as critical today as it was then. By connecting to the work, the worker, and the workplace, we evolved to remain relevant and to keep the U.S. economy humming. So what does connecting look like at NCCI? Well, we've chosen to take a larger role in thought leadership. Examples include our recent publication on the opioid epidemic. We published research on this issue of cost shifting between workers' comp and SSDI. And Kathy's gonna spend more time on this in her presentation later on this morning. 
We modernized our systems to connect with our members. It's a campaign that we call Plug In and Power Up. It provides greater access to our analytics database that allows you to empower your decision making. And we announced the new data stream to help understand indemnity trends to stay ahead, connecting with the future. And we continue to connect with our members to showcase workplace success stories like Dan. You see, Dan was an asphalt plant manager. He was 34 years on the job. And while going up to remove debris from a hopper, his leg got caught in that hopper and he suffered a serious injury. His leg had multiple fractures. He had a deep laceration and things got complicated because he also, he also had diabetes. The initial recommendation from the local doctors was his leg needed to be amputated, okay? But the story didn't end there. His insurer, Nationwide Insurance, assigned an on-site catastrophic nurse and together with Dan and his wife, they got another opinion. Unfortunately, that same opinion said you need to amputate the leg, but the story didn't end there. You see, Nationwide found a physician that was farther away who came up with a treatment plan to save Dan's leg. And you know what? It worked. With his carrier and his employer's support, Dan returned to work first in modified duty status and then full duty status. And a key to this success story underlying everything was the return to work focus. I would encourage you to read many success stories like this on ncci.com. These are real examples of our system helping rebuild lives and rebuild careers. You know, doctors, nurses, insurers, and the employers all working to get an injured worker back to work. And I think that we should never forget these stories because they're really at the heart of what we do. So before I close out, I wanted to share something with you that you know, for 30 years, this event has become an important part of who we are at NCCI. Um, I find that it permeates our culture and it brings our mission to life. The employees of NCCI who are here and back at the office, they take great pride in bringing you outstanding content, speakers, and an incredible experience. And we truly hope that you find AIS valuable. So I started today with a look back of 30 years ago, and we've come a long way as an industry since that time. But in many ways, we're right where we were then, looking to the future and trying to improve the delivery of something that we believe in our hearts is critical to the well-being of the worker. I want to thank you all for coming. Have a great event.